The Ideal Made Real Chapter 7 Paths to Perpetual Increase The universe is overflowing with all manner of good things, and there is enough to supply every wish of every heart, with abundance still remaining. How every heart is to proceed, however, that its every wish may be supplied, has been the problem, but the solution is simple. In consequence, everybody may rejoice. This world is not a veil of tears, but is in truth a most delightful place, and is endowed with everything that is needful to make the life of man an endless song. We now know that we do not live to be miserable, but to rejoice. The bitterness that sometimes appears in life is not a real part of life. The greatness of existence alone is intended for man. To know the bitter from the sweet, and to appropriate the latter, and always reject the former, is a matter, however, that is not clearly understood. There may be thousands who know the bitter when they see it, but they do not always know how to reject it. To throw off the ills of life is an art that few have mastered, but those who can eliminate the wrong are not always able to distinguish the right from the wrong, the reason being that we have not looked at things from the viewpoint of that power that produces things. The philosophers, the theologians, and the scientists, as a rule, make life very complex and difficult to live. Their profound expressions confuse the multitudes, while ills and troubles continue as before. But to live is simple. Even a child can be happy. It therefore should not be difficult for anyone else. When we realize happiness in its highest, broadest sense, we find that it comes in its fullness only when we have everything that the heart desires. And since the desires of the heart increase in size and number with the enlargement of life, the joy of living will increase in proportion, providing all the desires of the heart are supplied. This fact, however, may at first seem to make happiness very difficult to secure. If we cannot enjoy the allness of joy until we have everything that heart can wish for, then happiness is far away, so it may seem. But things are not always what they seem. All things are possible, and the most difficult things become comparatively easy when we know how. Therefore, the way of wisdom is not to look for those difficulties that ignorance has connected with things, but look for that simplicity that is the soul of all knowledge. When we learn to do things as they should be done, all difficulties disappear, and even the largest life becomes simple. The doing of things is the universal theme in this age. Those who simply tell us what to do are no longer acceptable. We want practical instructions that tell us how. The greatest man of this age and of the future will not be the one who can move as he wishes the emotions of multitudes by the magic art of eloquence, and bring whole nations to his feet by the artistic juggling of elegant phrases, the great man will henceforth be the man who can tell us how, and who can express himself so clearly that anyone can understand. This, however, we are now beginning to do, and, ere long, the many will come back to the truth itself and understand the real truth in all its original simplicity. The path of truth in life is perfectly straight and is illumined all the way. It is therefore simplicity itself to follow this path when we find it, but the many have strayed into the jungles of illusions and misconceptions. 
these must all come back to the simple path, and when they do, the difficulty of living will wholly disappear. To teach the race how to find the simple things, the true things, and the real things, is now the purpose of every original thinker. And whoever can add to the world's wisdom in this respect becomes a light to the race indeed. One of the first principles in this new understanding of things is that which deals with man's power to place himself in perfect touch with the source of limitless supply. In other words, to enter the path of perpetual increase. As previously stated, the world is overflowing with good things, because life is in touch with the limitless source of all good things, and there is so much of everything that the wish of every heart can be gratified. We do not have to take from another to have abundance, because there is more than sufficient for all. The fact that someone has abundance does not prove that he has taken some or all of his wealth from others, although this is what a great many people believe to be the truth. Whenever we see someone in luxury, we wonder where and how he got it, and we usually add that many are in poverty because this one is in wealth. Such doctrine, however, is not true. It is thoroughly false from beginning to end. The world is not so poverty-stricken that the few cannot have plenty without stealing from the many. The universe is not so bare and so limited that multitudes are reduced to wanting whenever a few persons undertake to surround themselves with those things that have beauty and worth. True, there is injustice in the world. There are people who have secured their wealth not upon merit, but through the art of reducing others to want. But the remedy is not to be found in the doctrine that thousands must necessarily become poor when one becomes very rich. This doctrine is an illusion, and illusions cannot serve as foundations for a better order. There is enough in life to give every living person all the wealth and all the luxury that he can possibly appropriate. God is rich. The universe is overflowing with abundance. If we have not everything that we want, there is a reason. There is some definite cause, somewhere, either in ourselves or in our relations to the world, but this cause can be found and corrected. Then we may proceed to take possession of our own. Among the many cases of poverty and the lack of a full supply, there is one that has been entirely overlooked. To overcome this cause is to find one of the most important paths to perpetual increase and the remedy lies within easy reach of everyone who has awakened, to a degree, the finer elements in his life. There may be exceptions to the rule, but there are thousands who are living on the husks of existence because they were not grateful when the kernels were received. Multitudes continue in poverty from no other cause than a lack of gratitude and other thousands who have almost everything that the heart may wish for do not reach the coveted goal of full supply because their gratitude is not complete. We are now beginning to realize more and more that the greatest thing in the world is to live so closely to the infinite that we constantly feel the power and the peace of his presence. In fact, this mode of living is the very secret of secrets, revealing everything that the mind may wish to know or understand in order to make life what it is intended to be. We also realize that the more closely we live to the infinite, the more we shall receive of all good things, because all good things have their source 
in the Supreme. But how to enter into this life of Supreme Oneness with the Most High is a problem. There are many things to be done in order to solve this problem, but there is no one thing that is more important in producing the required solution than deep, whole-souled gratitude. The soul that is always grateful lives nearer the true, the good, the beautiful, and the perfect than anyone else in existence, and the more closely we live to the good and the beautiful, the more we shall receive all those good things. The mind that dwells constantly in the presence of true worth is daily adding to his own worth. He is gradually and steadily appropriating that worth with which he is in constant contact. But we cannot enter into the real presence of true worth unless we fully appreciate the real worth of true worth. And all appreciation is based upon gratitude. The more grateful we are for the good things that come to us now, the more good things we shall receive in the future. This is a great metaphysical law, and we shall find it most profitable to comply exactly with this law, no matter what the circumstances may be. Be grateful for everything, and you will constantly receive more of everything. Thus, the simple act of being grateful becomes a path to perpetual increase. The reason why is found in the fact that whenever you enter into the mental attitude of real gratitude, your mind is drawn into much closer contact with that power that produces the good things received. In other words, to be grateful for what we have received is to draw more closely to the source of that which we receive. The good things that come to us come because we have properly employed certain laws. And when we are grateful for the results gained, we enter into more perfect harmony with those laws, and thus become able to employ those laws to still greater advantage in the immediate future. This anyone can understand, and those who do not know that gratitude produces this effect should try it and watch results. The attitude of gratitude brings the whole mind into more perfect and more harmonious relations with all the laws and powers of life. The grateful mind gains a firmer hold, so to speak, upon those things in life that can produce increase. This is simply illustrated in personal experience where we find that we always feel nearer to that person to whom we express real gratitude. When you thank a person and truly mean it with heart and soul, you feel nearer to that person than you ever did before. Likewise, when we express whole-souled thanksgiving to everything and everybody for everything that comes into life, we draw closer and closer to all the elements and powers of life. In other words, we draw closer to the real source from which all good things in life proceed. When we consider this principle from another point of view, we find that the act of being grateful is an absolute necessity if we wish to accomplish as much as we have the power to accomplish. To be grateful in this large universal sense is to enter into harmony and contact with the greatest, the highest, and the best in life. We thus gain possession of the superior elements of mind and soul, and, in consequence, gain the power to become more and achieve more, no matter what our object or work may be. Everything that will place us in a more perfect relation with life, and thus enable us to appropriate the greater richness of life, should be employed with the greatest of earnestness, and deep whole-souled gratitude does possess a marvelous power in this respect. 
Its great value, however, is not confined to the laws just mentioned. Its power is exceptional in another and equally important field. To be grateful is to think of the best. Therefore, the grateful mind keeps the eye constantly upon the best. And, according to another metaphysical law, we grow into the likeness of that which we think of the most. The mind that is always dissatisfied fixes attention upon the common, the ordinary, and the inferior, and thus grows into the likeness of those things. The creative forces within us are constantly making us just like those things upon which we habitually concentrate attention. Therefore, to mentally dwell upon the inferior is to become inferior, while to keep the eye single upon the best is to daily become better. The grateful mind is constantly looking for the best, thus holding attention upon the best, and daily growing into the likeness of the best. The grateful mind expects only good things, and will always secure good things out of everything that comes. What we constantly expect, we receive, and when we constantly expect to get good out of everything, we cause everything to produce good. Therefore, to the grateful mind, all things will, at all times, work together for good, and this means perpetual increase in everything that can add to the happiness and the welfare of man. This being true, and anyone can prove it to be true, the proper course to pursue is to cultivate the habit of being grateful for everything that comes. Give thanks eternally to the Most High for everything, and feel deeply grateful every moment to every living creature. All things are so situated that they can be of some service to us, and all things have somewhere, at some time, been instrumental in adding to our welfare. We must, therefore, to be just and true, express perpetual gratitude to everything that has existence. Be thankful to yourself. Be thankful to every soul in the world. And most of all, be thankful to the Creator of all that is. Live in perpetual thanksgiving to all the world, and express the deepest, sincerest, most whole-souled gratitude you can feel within whenever something of value comes into your life. When other things come, pass them by, never mind them in the least. You know that the good in greater and greater abundance is eternally coming into your life, and for this give thanks with rejoicing. You know that every wish of the heart is being supplied. Be thankful that this is true, and you will draw nearer and nearer to that place in life where that can be realized that you know is on the way to realization. Live according to this principle for a brief period of time, and the result will be that your life will change for the better to such a degree that you will feel infinitely more grateful than you ever felt before. You will then find that thanksgiving is a necessary part of real living, and you will also find that the more grateful you are for every ideal that has been made real, the more power you gain to press on to those greater heights where you will find every ideal to be real. And when this realization begins, you are on the path to perpetual increase, because the more you receive, the more grateful you feel, and the more grateful you feel for that which has been received, the more closely you will live to that source that can give you more. The Ideal Made Real Chapter 8 Consider the Lilies Consider the lilies of the field, 
how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you, that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Matthew 6, verse 28-29 The greatest service that any one can render to the race is to properly fill the place he occupies now, to be himself today. But it is not only others that will benefit by such individual actions. The individual himself will receive greater good from life through this method than through all other methods combined. The great secret of secrets is to live your own life in your own world as well as you possibly can now. In this age, thousands are seeking the path of spiritual growth and high intellectual attainments, while millions are dreaming of the life beautiful. Accordingly, systems, almost without number, are springing up everywhere, claiming to reveal the hidden path to these greater goals. But it is the truth that when everything has been said, the one statement that rises above them all is this, Be all that you are today, and you shall be even more tomorrow. If you are in search of higher spiritual and intellectual attainments, enter into every form of wisdom that surrounds you today, and fill your life with as much spirit as you can possibly realize. If you wish to live an ideal life, then aim to make real the most beautiful life that you can think of today. If you are longing for greater accomplishments and a larger sphere of usefulness, then be your very best in the place that you occupy now. The mighty oak grows great because it grows in the present. It does not think of the past or the future. It is what it is now. It does not wish to become mighty. It simply grows on silently and continually. The lily of the field is beautiful because it is perfectly satisfied to be a lily, but it is not satisfied to be less than all a lily can be. It does not strive or work hard to become beautiful. It simply goes on being what it is, and the result is it has been made immortal by the greatest mind that ever lived. When we follow the example of the lily, we find the real secret of life so simply and clearly stated that anyone can understand. Be what you are today. Do not be satisfied to be less than you can today, and do not strive to be more. Progress, growth, advancement, attainment, these do not come through overreaching. The mind that overreaches will have a reaction. He will fall to the bottom and will have to begin all over again. Real attainment comes by being your best where you are just for today by filling the present moment with all the life you are conscious of. No more. If you try to express more life than you can comfortably feel in consciousness, you are overreaching and you will have a fall. The great mistake of the age is to strive, to go about our work as if it were extremely difficult. The man who works the hardest usually accomplishes the least while the truly great man is the man who has trained his life and his power to work through him. The lilies of the field are not engaged in hard labor, and yet their usefulness cannot be measured. They are fulfilling their true purpose. They are making real the ideal in their own world, and they are living inspirations to every soul in existence. They live to be beautiful, and they become beautiful, not by being ambitious for beauty, but by permitting all the beauty they possess to come forth. What is within us is constantly pressing for expression. 
We do not have to call it forth, nor labor so much to bring it into action. All we are required to do is to permit ourselves to be what we are, to permit what is within to express itself fully and completely. We do not have to work so hard to become great. We are all naturally great, and our potential greatness is ever ready to manifest if we would only cease our striving and let life live. The lily is beautiful because it does not hinder its own inherent beauty from coming forth to be seen. But if the lily should take up the strenuous life, it would in one generation become a despised weed. The human race today resembles in too many instances the useless weed. Millions in every generation come and go without accomplishing anything whatever. They do not even live a life that gives contentment. The reason is they strive too much, and in their striving destroy the very powers that can produce greatness. We have worked hard for results, not knowing that the only cause of results was within us ready to produce the very results we desired just for the asking. We have in many instances destroyed our brains trying to invent methods for producing health, happiness, power, and success, not knowing that these things already existed within us in abundant supply, and that by wholesome thinking they would appear in full ex external expression. The secret of secrets is to let the best within us have full right of way. This, however, most of us have failed to do. In consequence, the majority are undeveloped weaklings of little use to themselves or to the world. The lily permits that which is to have the right of way. It does not interfere, but man does interfere. He usually refuses to accept the gifts which nature wishes to bestow upon him, and he hardly ever accepts assistance from a higher power. He sets out for himself and works himself into old age and death, trying to gain what was actually given to him in the beginning. He leaves the real riches of life and enters the world of personal ambition, expecting to find something better and create something superior through his own efforts. But he fails because man alone can do nothing. The average person does not realize that to create something from nothing is impossible, nor has he learned that the necessary something can only come from the life that is within. He may try to accomplish much and become much through personal ambition and hard work, but no one can build without material, and the material that is needed in building greatness can be secured only by giving right of way to the life and the power of the inner world. The man who expects to build greatness upon personal limitations will pass away in the effort, leaving his unfinished work to be taken up by someone else who will possibly build upon the same useless foundation. Thus, one generation after another comes and goes, each expecting to succeed where predecessors failed. In the meantime, very little is accomplished by man, and he fails to receive what infinite life is ever waiting to give. This is the truth about man in general. The multitudes have come and gone during countless ages, and have accomplished but little. There have been a few great exceptions in every age, but these were exceptions because they refused to follow the ways of the world. They learned the lesson that the lilies have taught, and they chose to let life live, and let the greatness from within come forth, 
to let power work and to let that which is in the real man have full right of way. When a person discovers what he is and permits that which he is to have full expression, his days of weariness, trouble, and failure are gone. Henceforth he will live as the flower, his life will be full, he will fulfill his purpose and eternally become more and more of that which already is in the great within. When a flower which has so little of soul within itself can become so much by permitting itself to be itself, how much more might man become if he would permit himself to be himself? Man is created in the image of God, therefore marvels are hidden within his wonderful soul. When these marvels are given full expression, then man begins to become that which the infinite intended that he should be. In the soul of the lily is hidden the spirit of beauty, nothing more. But the lily does not hinder this spirit from appearing in visible form. Therefore it becomes an inspiration of joy to all the world. In the soul of man even the infinite is hidden. We can therefore imagine what man will become when he permits the spirit of divinity to express itself in his personal form. This is a great truth indeed, and deserves constant attention from every mind that has learned to think. We may believe that every step forward that we have taken has been produced through personal effort and hard work, but in this we are mistaken. In the first place, those achievements that have followed hard work are always insignificant and never of any permanent value. But those steps forward that have permanent value and that are truly great, we find were taken during those moments when we permitted real life to live. We therefore find that striving accomplishes nothing, while we may, through living, accomplish anything. There are times when many of us cease our strenuous labor for a few moments and unconsciously open our souls to that higher something that we feel so much the need of when wearied with misdirected labors and the influx of real life that comes at such times is the cause of those real steps upward and onward that we have taken. At such times we chose to be like the lily, we permitted the good that was to come forth. We gave up, so to speak, to higher power and did not interfere with its highest, fullest expression. What we gain at such moments is always with us and never fails to give us strength, power and inspiration even when we decide for the time being to adopt the ways of the world once more. But since every step in advance comes when we refuse to go the way of the world, we should now understand that the way of the world is a mistake. We should therefore free ourselves from that mode of life, thought and action absolutely. The world seeks to gain greater things through personal ambition and hard work. The true way to attain greater things is to permit the greatness that is within to have full expression. Likewise, when we seek health, happiness and harmony, or a beautiful life, the true course is to permit those things to come forth and act through us they are ready to appear. We do not have to work for them or strive so hard to secure them. They are now at hand and will express themselves through us the very moment we grant them permission. We have all discovered that whenever we become perfectly still and permit supreme life to live in us, we can feel power accumulating in our system until we feel as if we could move mountains. 
We have also felt that while turning attention to the everlasting joy within and opening the mind fully to this joy, that there came into being a state of happiness, comfort, and contentment that seemed infinitely more perfect than the imagination has ever pictured the joys of heaven to be. Likewise, when we fail to find health in the without, or through external means we invariably found the precious gift coming from within, the moment we gave up, so to speak, to its wholesome life and power. In this age, personal ambition is one of the ruling factors, and nearly everybody is trying to outdo someone else. The result is, we build up and tear down in the outer world, but as a race we improve but little. The great within is ignored, held back, or prevented from free expression, while there are few things in the great without that are really worth while. There never was a time when we should consider the lilies of the field more than now. The human race is breaking itself down, striving to gain hold upon phantoms, while the great prize that has already been given is lost sight of in the dust and confusion. But to inspire the present generation with the desire to return to nature and her beautiful ways cannot be done to any extent, however, except through living examples. It is the living of life that will change the life of the world. The world at large does not listen to reason, nor can those who are in the mad rush stop to think. Besides, such minds are not sufficiently clear to understand the principles upon which the living of life is based. Seeing is believing, as far as the world is concerned, and therefore they require living examples of those who have proven the superiority of the better way. Accordingly, those who know how to live as the lilies live should consider it a privilege to place their light wherever it can be seen. When you can prove, through your own life and experience, that personal ambition and hard work are not necessary to greater things, but are actual hindrances, and that greater things come of themselves to those who will permit themselves to be themselves, you have caused a great light to spring up, and few there are who will not see it. Those who take everything literally may wonder how anything can be accomplished without work, but they must bear in mind that there is work and work. The work that is done by those who are down in the world's way is hard, wearing and tearing. It is destructive to human life and builds up one thing by tearing down another, and, in the end, it brings no lasting good, neither to the individual nor to the race. But the work that is done by those who have found the better way is neither hard nor wearisome. It is not done through strenuous living nor external striving, but is done by the power of the great within coming forth into expression in personal life. In this mode of work, you first give your inner power right of way, then you direct it consciously and intelligently. You do not depend upon personal power and difficult personal efforts. You place yourself in the hands of higher power and as you receive higher power, you cause it to do that which you wish to have done. You have all felt power working through you, and at such times work was pleasure. You gave the commands, of course, and you knew it was your own power, your own higher power, but no hard personal effort was required. You simply opened the way somehow, 
then decided firmly but gently what you wished to have done, and you could feel a mighty power coming forth, seemingly from an inexhaustible source, taking full possession of thought and muscle, and doing the very thing you desired to have done. After the work was finished, you discovered it was superior work, and although you had engaged in the task for many hours, you actually felt stronger than when you began. The reason why is simple. You did not depend upon personal limitations and strenuous efforts, and you did not try to make those limitations do a great deal more than they had the capacity to do. You opened your life to all the power of your life, and you thus received enough power to do what you wish to have done and more. And so long as you have power to spare, you can be neither weak nor tired. When the system is thoroughly full of energy, work is a pleasure. And so long as that fullness continues, weariness is impossible. And there is enough power in real life to cause your system to be full of energy and more at all times, no matter how much you may do or how great your task may be. When we consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, we find that they naturally permit the life that is within them to unfold. They do not try to grow. They have, as everything has, the power of growth within them, and they grow because they do not hinder that interior power and growth from having their way. Likewise, when we know that divinity reigns within us, we do not have to work hard nor many years to reach that state. We will grow and develop both mentally and spiritually when we permit the divinity within us to unfold. Everything seeks self-expression. Nothing in nature, visible or invisible, will have to be forced into expression, because at the very heart of all things there is the deep, strong desire to come forth and be. Therefore, if we wish to ascend in the scale of life, we must cease those confused and destructive states of mind that hinder expression and become as the lilies of the field. Give the life within permission to really live in us. The life within will live our life and give us a beautiful life. The power within will do our work and do that work extremely well. The divinity within will make us godlike in all things and never cease to give us the things of the Spirit so long as we permit those things to come forth and abide in personal existence. What we are required to do, that such things may come to pass, is to live, think, and act in the likeness of the infinite. God is, and he permits himself to be what he is. Man must do likewise, and all shall be well with him. Those who do not understand may think that the individuality of man might diminish if he were to give himself up to the life and the power within, but such a conclusion will disappear when we realize that the power from within is our own. We are simply causing ourselves to become more and more of what we already are in reality. By giving free expression to our own higher interior powers, we naturally become more powerful, and by giving free expression to our own inherent divinity, we naturally become more godlike and more spiritual on every plane of being. 
The lilies of the field do not become inferior lilies by permitting the spirit of the beautiful to unfold from within their gentle lives. It is by this method that they become what they are, and they become so much that the glory of artificial man can never compare with theirs. It is the same with the human soul. The soul becomes great and beautiful by permitting its own greatness and loveliness to come forth unhindered and undisturbed. Thousands of people are at present trying to develop higher powers. Many of these actually try to work hard in their efforts to gain the various gifts of mind and soul. And because they do not succeed to any great extent, they frequently become discouraged and give up, wondering whether or not the real truth has been found. Others, being ambitious to become great in the world, try to employ spiritual laws in the furthering of their personal aims, but they find the reaction so disagreeable that the prize is not worth the labor. To fly to the top at once is the ruling passion among many, and, when they fail, with whatever methods they employ, they conclude that what passes for truth is nothing but man-made doctrines. The fact is, however, that the truth always appears to be the untruth when misdirected. To apply the principles of real truth in furthering any lofty aim we may have in mind, the first essential is to establish life in perfect touch with eternal life. The second essential is to positively determine what we expect to attain and become in actual personal living. And the third essential is to proceed in the attainment of health, happiness, and harmony. Without health, nothing of permanent value can be accomplished. Without happiness, our talents will be as the flowers without sunshine. And without harmony, most of the power we might receive would be thrown away. To obtain health, happiness, and harmony, we need simply let life live. Real life already has these things, and when we let life live in us, those things will be expressed through us. The next essential is to resolve that we will be fully contented simply to live. To shine in the world, to acquire fame or to do something wonderful that mankind may long remember us, that we will not think of. Many a person has worked hard for fame and died early in obscurity. Fame in itself, however, is of no value. When you are neither happy nor well, fame cannot make your life worth while. If you are miserable, it will profit nothing if everybody may know your name. It is not the praise of man that we should seek, but the life of the infinite. The praise of the world can give us nothing, but life from within can give us everything that the heart can wish for. True fame comes to him who deserves it without his trying to get it. But those only can deserve the honor of the race who have always been their best who have not neglected a single opportunity to be of service, and who have lived constantly for the one purpose of being an inspiration to every soul. We may look at this phase of the subject as we may. We can come to only one conclusion. He alone is great and deserving of honor, who so lives that he always is all that God made him to be, and it is such a life that is lived by the lilies of the field. When man will be as true to his large world 
as the lilies are to their small world, man will become a race of gods indeed, and the utopian dreams of the prophets will come true. This, however, the ordinary thinker may declare to be impossible, but nothing is impossible. If a flower can be true to itself in its world, man can be true to himself in his world. Those who are accustomed to the worldly methods of thinking and working may feel that it is hardly possible to apply these new ideas while associated with worldly minds. But we must remember that it is not where we work or at what we work, but how we work that determines what results are to be. To so work that you permit the boundless power within to work through you is the secret, and this will not only cause your work to be pleasant, but will also cause you to do better and better every day. It is therefore the royal path to pleasantness today and greater things tomorrow. In the old way you are compelled to almost wear yourself out today in order that you might provide for tomorrow, but not so in the new. While you are providing for tomorrow, you are not only enjoying life today, but you are, through the expression of greater and greater power from within, making yourself larger, stronger, and greater today. In the development of talents, you employ the same principle. You do not strive for greatness. You know that you are potentially great already. And by permitting this greatness to become alive in you, you will accomplish great things. When you apply this principle in everything that you do, you will find your advancement to be steady and even rapid. You will move forward in all things, making the ideal real as you ascend in the scale. The very moment you find a new ideal, you find that power within you that can make that ideal real. Thus, your advancement becomes continuous, your progress eternal. To live the life beautiful, we simply let life live. We know that life itself is beautiful, and when we permit that life that is beautiful to live in us, we will live consciously and personally the most beautiful life that we can picture in the ideal without making any personal effort to do so. When we begin to live, think, and act according to these principles, we feel that we are carried on and on by some mysterious presence that seems to be doing everything for us while giving us the pleasure and the glory. We soon learn, however, that this presence is ourself, our own larger, superior self, created in the image of God, therefore able to do everything that we may wish to have done, and it is a joy indeed to feel everything moving so smoothly and gently, so harmoniously and pleasantly, and at the same time producing such great results. To engage in some extraordinary work becomes one of our greatest pleasures, because nothing is hard or difficult any more. Obstacles disappear the very moment we enter their presence, and we realize inwardly that whatever we undertake to do will be accomplished. We no longer tremble when in the midst of events that require exceptional wisdom and power. We know that wisdom is ready to speak whatever may be necessary now, and that power is at hand to do whatever may be necessary to be done now. We are in touch with the greatness of the great within, and may draw upon that great inexhaustible source whatever we may need at any time. Fear takes flight 
while faith becomes stronger, higher, and more perfect. Sorrow and despair are no more, because all things are working for the best. Even in the presence of death and loss we see more life and greater gain. We may know that what passes away merely ascends, that it may live more and be itself in a larger, higher measure than it ever was before. We know that whatever comes will bring the new and the more beautiful. It could not be otherwise, because having chosen to be all that we are, the all can never cease to come. And the more the all continues to come, the more all will continue to bring. We have laid aside the illusions of the world and adopted the ways of truth. We have beheld the beauties of nature and have opened our minds to the visions of the soul. These have given us the secret. And like the lilies of the field, we have learned to be still and live.